Hello and welcome to this video in which we're going to be looking at how to trace a merge sort algorithm um, based on the specification from AQA A-level computer science. Before we start, let's just talk a little bit about merge sorts just so that we all know what we're dealing with. A merge sort is an example of a divide and conquer algorithm and it is a very, very efficient way of sorting a list of items into order. Um, the notion of a divide and conquer algorithm is that a problem is broken down into smaller units that are then processed in those small units and combined back to form the solution. As with other divide and conquer algorithms, merge sort algorithms use recursion so that they can call themselves repeatedly uh, until a base case is reached. And that base case in this example is where the, the, uh, the lists are broken down to the point that there are a number of lists with only one item in each list. And this will make a bit more sense in a moment when I show you visually what this looks like. So these sublists, when we've got them, are then combined back in order until the list is fully sorted, fully combined. All the sublists are combined together and we have an ordered list. So let's look first of all at dividing a list. So this is the divide part of divide and conquer. So here's um, a list of integers, 6, 3, 4, 8, and 5. And as you can see, here is the start of our list. And uh, we've got a pointer here to the middle of our list and the end of our list. And that's pretty obvious to us, but that will become quite useful later when we look at our algorithm. So the first thing we need to do is we need to split this list. Now, there are five items in this list, so um, we have to make an arbitrary call as to whether we're going to do the split after two items or after three items, uh, and that doesn't matter as long as we're consistent uh, in our application throughout our algorithm. However, if you imagine that start is item number one, end is item number five, well, one plus five equals six. Six divided by two gives us three, so my inclination is to say, well, then the split will be at one, two, three, so between the four and the eight in this list. So we split our list into two sublists, one of which has three items, one of which has two items. And then we recursively do the same again, so that we now have uh, our lists here. This list has been split into six and three, which can still be split further. Um, four is on its own, we've reached a base case. Eight and five are individual lists, so they also have reached their base case, so there'll be no attempt to split them further. But as I say, six and three, that list does get broken down one more time until we have all our items individually in their own lists. So that's how we divide. It's really easy. You just keep splitting. Uh, then we look at merging those lists back together. So here are our items again, six, three, four, eight, five individual items. And the general method is that we're going to take um, two lists and they go into our merge algorithm. So the merge algorithm accepts two lists and it looks at the first item in each list, works out which one's the smaller one and puts that into a, uh, a temporary additional list. So let's look at that together. We're going to take these two lists to start with, the one with six in and the one with three in, and we're gonna put the items into a new temporary additional list. So we compare the first item in each of the two lists to merge. So in this case, each list only has one item, but later we'll be calling the same algorithm with lists with multiple items. So we always look at the first one. So six and three. Well, list two has the smaller item. So we copy the three from list two uh, and we place it in our new temporary list and then we remove it from the parent list. Once we've removed it from the parent list, um, we then, uh, if both lists still contain items, repeat that process. Well, they don't. Uh, this one doesn't contain any items now. So skip on to here. Once one list is empty, yep, that's this list, uh, copy over each of the remaining items in the other list. Well, there's only that one to copy over, so we do that. So we've now got a sub list, or sorry, a merged list of those two, which is inherently in order. And that was really easy. It took like no particularly difficult processing to achieve that. And then we move on to our next pair of lists. So we look at the four, the eight, and we repeat the process. So compare the two lists, the first item in each one. Four is smaller than eight, so four gets copied into our new merge list. Um, 
This list now has no items in it, so we move on to just copying the items that remain in the other list, and we drop that in, and we're done. Um, we're going to leave the five for now. Uh, that will get pulled in later. Um, don't worry too much about that, but yeah, as you see, we'll, we'll, we'll get that in a bit. Now we're going to repeat that same process using our new merge lists. So our, our two lists we're looking at is this list, three, six, and this list, four, eight. So if you remember our algorithm, it said the first thing we had to do was compare the first item in each list. And three is smaller than four, so three gets copied into our new merge list and removed from its parent list. So now we compare the first item in each list again. Well, the first item in this list is six, and the first item in this list is four. Four is smaller, so four gets copied over and removed from its parent list. So now we repeat the process again we look at the first item in each list. Each list now only contains six and eight. Six is smaller, goes into our merge list, and is removed from the parent, at which point we have a list with no items in it. So we're not now comparing first items anymore, we're just copying over all remaining items from this list. So we copy the eight over, and we've got our new merge list. Now we are comparing this list with this list. So let's have a go. Compare first items, three and five. Three is smaller, three gets copied into our new merge list. Let's compare first items again, four and five. Four is smaller, so four goes into our merge list. We compare first items again, six in this list with five in this list. Five is smaller, so five gets copied into our merge list and it will then get removed from this list, um, which means that we now have a list with no items in it, so we don't do any comparisons anymore, we just simply start copying the uh, remaining items from this list in order. So six goes over, eight goes over, and now we get to the final stage where there are no items, oops, there are no items in uh, that remaining list either, so we are finished, and we only have one list uh, left, so we're done. That's it. We have done our, um, our merge sort by simply comparing lists, putting them in order, and that's used far less processing power and time than something like a bubble sort. Indeed, the time complexity of a merge sort is O n log n, so as the list gets bigger, it does not get substantially um, slower to do. In fact, it sort of plateaus out, complete opposite, really of a uh, bubble sort which gets exponentially longer the more items you add. So that is the theory and, uh, and that's, you know, that hopefully gives you a good grounding in how, uh, what a merge sort is and the process involved. Now we're going to go to looking at an example exam question and this exam question comes from AQA's specimen exam questions for paper one. Uh, these are some additional questions because this wasn't in the uh, old spec, so they've released these for us to look at. And uh, you can access these. Uh, they're not hidden or, or unavailable or anything like that, so you can, you can access it yourself by going to this URL. Um, and let's just have a quick peek at the uh, question in the paper that we're going to be looking at doing. Okay, so here is our, um, our exam paper, and it's question two in the paper. It says, figure one contains pseudocode for a recursive merge sort algorithm. Figure two contains pseudocode for an algorithm called merge that is called by the merge sort algorithm in figure one. So here's the, uh, the recursive algorithm merge sort. It accepts three parameters. L is the list um, which you want to sort. S is uh, a pointer to the start of the list. So where do you want to start um, doing your sorting? and E is the end. Where do you want to end your sorting? Uh, let's have a look. If the start is less than the end, so if start pointer is less than end pointer, then get a middle pointer, which uses div, that's floor division or integer division, so that basically uh, divides by two but completely ignores um, the fractional part or the, the bit after the decimal point. So if you had, for example, uh, two plus three, that equals five, div two, will equal 2, not um, 2.5, which is equal to. Uh, so if start is less than end, we get a mid pointer, and then we get a new 
uh, sublist, like our left half of our list, which we get by calling ourselves again, merch sort, providing the same original list, providing the same original start position, but now providing our end position, which is actually the middle of our original list. Once that has, uh, that will then keep calling this until it eventually gets to its base case. Uh, once eventually it's, it's finished its job, it returns a, um, a sorted sublist. Uh, we move on to getting our right hand side, which again we do by calling ourselves, passing the original list, but starting at the midpoint of plus one and ending at the originally specified end of the list. Once we are done and we've done all of that, we then return um, the merge of the left side and the right side together, and we do that by calling the merge function down here. So the merge function takes two lists in, creates a third list, which is a temporary empty list, and it says while uh, the length of list one is greater than zero, so while there's items in list one and items in list two, if, and I warn you now, this is a bit funny because um, in this particular example, AQA have used this to uh, do a merge sort that returns items in reverse order, so not ascending order, so it's going to go, it's actually going to go highest to lowest rather than lowest to highest, which every other case would pretty much be lowest to highest, so it's a bit of a tricky question, um, but you'll see why in the middle. So if uh, the first item in list one is less than the first item in list two, then append to list three the first item from list two. See what I mean? So let's say we had two lists and we had a three and a four. What we're actually saying is put the four in as the first item in that list three rather than putting the three in. So it's putting in the bigger number of the two. Once we've appended the first item from list two into list three, uh, we remove that item, that first item from list two, so it's no longer there anymore. Um, else, so if actually list two has the smaller item, then put the first item from list one into our temporary list three and remove that item from list one. And that will keep looping round until either list one has no items left or list two has no items left. At which point we skip down here and we say, okay, well, while list one has some items in it, which it might not do, but assume it does, then we just copy the first item and remove the first item. Go back, copy the first item, remove the first item, and keep doing that until we've got no items left in list one, i.e. this is just copying all the remaining items in list one to the end of list three. Um, if, however, it was a uh, list one that got emptied first in this original while loop, then we would actually that would never run, and we would jump to this one, which says while list two has some items in it. Again, copy all the items. Once we've done all of that, we return our temporary list three, which is, a, which is our sorted merge of lists one and two, and they get sent back up to uh, this line here. It comes out here, so, and it returns, so merge sort then returns the returned list from merge, if that makes sense. Finally, this uh, last part of uh, the merge sort algorithm here says that, well, if, um, if the start is not, it, it, we originally were saying if the start is less than the end, else, so if the start is not less than the end, uh, i.e. we're down to the point now that we've only got one item in our list, then rather than trying to split it again, just ret basically return the result of appending um, the item from the list, the original source list, which is at the start, into an empty list. So this is a way of making sure that what's returned isn't just the value of that item in the list, but is a list containing that item, because this is key. We actually have to return, for the algorithm to work, we have to return lists containing one item, rather than just contain, returning, say, an integer that represents that item. We need a list with one item in it. So. Um, that's what we do here. So this is the base case of our recursion. Uh, the base case is when S is equal to or greater than E. It's basically the opposite of whatever it is that causes further recursion to happen. Okay, so when S is greater than or equal to E, that is our best case. In that instance, we just return a list with that one item in it. So that's the algorithm. Then the paper goes on to give us a bit more help. It tells us um, in case we weren't sure what these uh, functions were, because they're not in AQA's pseudocode guide, it does tell us how they work. So it says, remove first item takes a list, 
and returns a list that contains all the items except the original, uh, the first one in that original list. For example, if names is the list Gemma, Richard, Georgina, and Margaret, then a function called remove first item names will return Richard, Georgina, Margaret. It also goes on to tell us what len does. Len takes a list and returns a number of items in the list. And it tells us what append does. The append function takes an item and a list and returns a list that contains all the items from the original list followed by the item that is passed. For example, if names is the list Gemma, Richard, Georgina, Margaret, then the function can uh, call append mat to names will return Gemma, Richard, Georgina, Margaret, and Matt. Uh, and finally, yep, the first item in the list has an index of one. So AQA's pseudocode does not have arrays that start with an index of zero. They always start with one. And then we go on to our question. So what's meant by a recursive subroutine? Well, hopefully you can do that from theory. What's the base case for the subroutine merge sort? Uh, we've already said that it is the opposite of whatever causes further reverse, uh, recursion, which in this case is s is less than e. So the base case is less uh, s is greater than or equal to e. And then here's the stuff we really get to. We have to complete the table one, the trace table, showing the result of tracing merge sort um, with a function call of merge sort list to sort one to five, where list to sort is six three four eight five. You may remember that those are the integers we used in our demonstration of the merge sort just now. It says that the first six rows and the call number column have been completed for us. That's really useful. Uh, what I would say in this is don't start here. Start at the beginning, uh, maybe on some scrap paper, doing it yourself, but use these six lines to check that what you're doing is the same as what AQA have done. This is really handy because it's a way of knowing that you're on the right lines before you proceed to do all the rest of it. So if you just say, oh, I'll just start here, uh, A, you won't have got into the algorithm from the right place, so you might be a bit confused as to what's going on, but B, you're forfeiting the opportunity to actually test your method um, right there in the middle of an exam. So always start at the beginning yourself um, using these lines as a bit of a test case to make sure that what you're doing is, is what you'd expect to happen. So this is what we're going to do now. We're going to go through the algorithms and complete this trace table ourselves, having a look at um, what happens at each stage. And we're also going to keep, we're a bit mindful because I've looked ahead. Um, at the very end of this, we're asked to explain why there are three occasions when there will be four stack frames on the stack when the subroutine called merge sort list sort 15 is made. So as well as completing this, the trace table, I'm also going to keep a little representation of what's on the stack so that we have an idea of um, how to answer that question later. Right, let's get started. So here we've got um, the list to sort that we're sorting. It's 63485. We've got our subroutine call that we are supposed to be doing the trace table for. So the trace table we're doing is for merge sort. We are not doing a trace table of merge, we're doing a trace table of merge sort, okay? Keep that in mind. And uh, we are past these parameters or these arguments to our parameters. List to sort is L, one is S, and E is going to be five when we first call it. So the very first time we call merge sort, in fact I might just use my little laser pointer to help us. First time that we call merge sort is going to be call number one to merge sort. And we're going to have the values s is 1, e is 5, and we haven't yet worked out m. So let's pop those in. And you'll notice as we go through this, a little indicator showing where we're up to. And you'll notice also on our stack, we've put our first call to merge sort. Is now We've got a stack frame representing this instance of the merge sort uh, subroutine call. So... We're on call one, S is one, E is five. And um, throughout this process, you're going to notice this green box comes up. It should actually be a green tick, uh, but having moved between two different computers, this computer doesn't show the tick, so it shows a green box instead. But you can imagine that that is a nice tick to say, yes, S is indeed less than E. Therefore, this is true, and therefore we're going to go on and we're going to work out a value of M 
by getting s plus e, that's 1 plus 5, or 6, div 2 is 3, so we put that in our uh, trace table, still on the line of the first call to merge sorts, and we move on to go from here. So now we need to, the next thing says, well, we're going to get L1. L1 we get by calling merge sort again and using the original list, passing S as our start, but this time passing M, the value of M, as our, as our end value. So this kicks off another call to merge sort, represented by the blue arrow, and you'll see we have a second uh, instance of merge sort on our stack now, so we've kind of paused this one on the stack, it's got the state hit, sort of uh, represented, and we're starting a new call to merge sort. And so we're now on call number two to merge sort. S is one still. E is three, the former value of M. And we're going to go through and check, is S less than E? Yes, it is. So let's go on and work out a new value of M. One plus three is four, divided by two is two. So M is two. And the next thing we're going to go on to do is we're going to have to call another instance of merge sort to get L1 for the second call. So we now have green arrows representing a third call to merge sort, and we've now got three calls to merge sort on our stack. Our values, our parameter values are 1 and 2, 2 being the former value of M, which now gets, becomes the value of E in this instance of merge sort. Uh, S less than E, yes that is true again, so we go on and we work out another value of M uh, by doing S plus E, or 1 plus 2, which is 3, div 2 gives us 1 again. And we're going to go on to form yet another call to merge sort. So we now have a fourth call of merge sort on our stack, so we have four frames on our stack. We're into call 4 now where S is 1 and E is 1. Ah, interesting. S is 1 and E is 1. So now we are not going to be able to run what's nested inside this if block. We have, in fact, hit our first time that we've hit a base case for our recursive algorithm. We're going to get jump straight to the else, and we return um, L... Uh, the S... Sorry, we're going to return a single item list whose value is um, the value at s inside our original list. Well, s is 1, so that means we're going to return the first item in our original list, which is 6. So we return a, a list containing just a single item, 6. Um, because we've now returned that, we've finished that call to the fourth uh, fourth instance of merge sort, it comes off the stack heap and execution returns back to the third call. So we now are back in our third call, so we rewrite call three and we copy down our values from before, S and E and M. And actually we can identify that the returned list from the fourth call is actually the value of L1 for call three because it's, it gets returned here to L1 for call three. Uh, so, our third call to merge sort proceeds, and we have to now get L2, which we get by running another merge sort, this time passing in M plus 1 as our start, and E as our end. So that starts a fifth call to merge sort, which sticks on our stack heap again. So now we have four items, four frames on our stack heap, the fourth of which is the fifth call to merge sort. So we write in here, call number five. S is two, because it's M plus one, where M previously was one, so M plus one is one plus one is two. End is whatever it was originally for uh, our third call, which was two. So we've now got a situation that we're running merge sort where S is two and E is two which means that our if block does not run, and we go straight back down to, we're in another base case, and this time we return item 2, because S is 2, item 2 from our original list, which is 3, so we return a list with a single item, 3. Because now we're returning, that means we've reached the end of this call, so this fifth call comes 
off our stack, or at least it should in a moment, and um, what we can do is we can say that actually we're returning, sorry, before we, it comes off our stack, we might just say the fifth call returns the value, single item three, and that is L2 for call three. Okay, that falls off our stack. And we proceed to continue running call three. Call three now gets to this point where it has to return the value of the merge function for its lists one and two, which means it triggers off a whole new load of processing down here on the merge function. So we've now got four items on our stack again. We've got three instances of merge sort, and we've got one instance of merge, which came from call three of merge sort. So we've still got four items on our stack. And let's now proceed to trace or to think about what happens inside merge sort. Well, merge sort runs. It creates an empty list called L3, which we're going to represent up here. And it says, while list one has more than one item, yes, it does. And list two has more than one item, yes, it does. Um, we go on to look at the values in there. Is the first item in list one smaller than the first item in list two? Well, first item in list one is six. And the first item in list uh, two is three. So no, that's not true. So we skip straight on to our else. And our else tells us to put the first item in list one, which is a six, into L3. Then it tells us to remove it. So I've done a little strike through, so it's not there anymore. And it goes back to the start of the while loop. And it says again, while um, list one is greater than zero, oh, it's not anymore because it's got no items in it. So it's not greater than zero. So we go all the way to our next while list where we say, well, while list one has more items than zero, no, it doesn't. So it goes to our next while loop. Okay, while length of list two is greater than zero. Yes, it is. List two still has one item in it. So this while loop can run. And it tells us, okay, append the first item in list two to list three, which we do up here. And we then go on to our next line, which is remove that item from uh, list two, which we'll do. And by removing it, uh, we'll then try and run that while loop again, but we won't be able to because there won't be any items in it. So we get all the way down to the bottom of our merge sort where we return temporary list three. So list three is now returned, which means we can plonk it in here um, returned list for call three, because remember it was merge sort call three that ran this uh, subroutine of merge. So our execution of uh, merge is finished, so it comes off the stack, and we return execution to here, where we can now write our returned list is six and three. That means that, merge, that the third call to merge sort has finished. And we return execution back to merge sort uh, call two. Call three falls off the heap. We're back on call two now. Uh, so we put all the requisite values for call two back in our trace table. We just copy them down from the last time we saw call two, which was up here. So we're in call two. S is one, E is three, M is two. So we can copy those values down here. And execution now resides here. So we now have a value here for L1 in call two, and that is 6.3. And indeed, I'm now going to label it as such as well. So I say value of L1 for call two, just so I can remember it later. And we have to carry on processing uh, call two of merge sort to find its list two values. So we come down here and we start a sixth call to merge sort. So now back on our snap peak is call six, and in our trace table is called six. And call six has m plus one. Well, m was two, so m plus one is three. And it has e as its n value. Well, e was three, so it's still three. So call six to merge sort runs with the s three and e three, which means that our if block doesn't run. It goes all the way down to our return of a single value being appended. Uh, and this time, that value is whatever was in our original list at position three, which is the number four. So we return a single list with a value four. That's the end of call six for merge sort. So merge six falls off the stack. Execution returns back to 
call to. And we can label um, that return value as the value for L2 for call to. Execution is back now here where the blue arrow is, and we're going to go on to the next step in call to. Call to now has to call the merge sort of L1 and L2. L1 being this list, 6 and 3, and L2 being this list, 4. I'm not going to talk you through it entirely, I'm just going to click through it and you can see what happens now. On our stack, we get the merge called by call2, so we've got three items on our stack frame, and we work through it. We create a new empty list L3. Uh, both lists do indeed have items in them, so we run our while loop. Uh, the first item in list one is smaller than the is not smaller, sorry, than the first item in list two. So we go straight to our else branch and we append the first item from list one into list three and we remove it from list one. And then we get to the end of our while loop and we go back to the start of our while loop. And it's still the case that we've got items in list one and list two. So we run our while loop again. Is the first item in list one smaller than the first item in list two? Yes, it is. So let's append the first item from list 2 into list 3. Then let's remove that item from list 2. Get back to the start of our while loop. Ah, list 2 doesn't have any items in it anymore, so we can't run this while loop. So we jump all the way down to this while loop. Does list 1 have items? Yes, it does. It's still got a 3 in it. So we run through and we append that 3 into list 3. And we remove that item from the front of list 1. Uh, and we get to the end of the while loop and we try running the while loop again but list 1 doesn't have any items in it anymore so that's the end of that and list 2 doesn't have any items so that's the end of that so we've got to the end of this call to merge by which we return the values of list 3 and we put that into our uh, trace table so we've got 643 we finish executing that so it falls off the stack we return control back to uh, call two to merge and we're at this line here where we have to return the merge of call twos lists two and three back to call one so merge uh, call two finally falls off the stack heap and we're finally back to call one call one returns to execution here so we've got a value for list one for um, call one of merge sort so we name it as such 643 that we've just got back from call 2 is actually the value of L1 for call 1. So we're back to call 1, so we put in call 1, we put in our original values, 1, 5, and 3, which come from up here, and we proceed to run the next line of call 1, which is to get uh, the value for L2. L2, again, requires another recursive call to merge sort, so we're now on our seventh call to merge sort, so on our stack heap is call 7 for the merge sort. And for this call, S is 4 because it's M plus 1 and M was 3 when we were in um, the first call, so it's 3 plus 1 is 4. E is 5 and that carries on, so we've got a call to merge sort where S is 4 and E is Five, which means that S is indeed less than E. So we go on, we get a new mid value. This time that mid value, uh, 4 plus 5 is 9. Div 2 is 4, so the mid value is 4. And we go on to make another recursive call to merge sort. So now sitting on our stack is an eighth call to merge sort where S is 4 and E is 4, which means that our if statement does not run. We are in our base case and we append back the fourth item from the original list, which is 8. So we return list uh, a single list with an 8 in it, and that is the value of list 1 for the seventh call of merge sort. We're now back in our seventh call of merge sort, and we proceed to process um, the next line, which is getting list 2 for that seventh call, which involves another call to merge sort, an eighth, uh, sorry, a ninth call to merge sort this time. Whew. Uh, and this ninth call, I should say call 9, not call 7, that's my error. Um, this ninth call has the values um, S is 5 and E is 5. 
which means that when it runs, it gets to its if statement, and it doesn't run, it jumps to the base case, and it simply returns the value in the fifth position in the original list, which is a 5. So it returns a 5. That return value is effectively what it is, the value of L2, or the contents of list 2, for the seventh call of um, merge sort. Mer the seventh call of merge sort continues to run. It now gets to this line where it calls the merge algorithm and its inputs to that merge algorithm are a, a list with an 8 in it and a list with a 5 in it. This proceeds to run. It creates an empty list 3. We compare these two um, and it runs through. No, um, 8 is not smaller than 5, so it goes down to the else branch where it appends the first item from list 1 into L3 list and then removes it from um, list 1. So list, now, list 1 now contains no items, so our while loop doesn't run anymore, so it jumps down to uh, checking if list 1 has any items. No, it doesn't, so it jumps down to the final while loop where it says, well, while list 2 has some items, which it does, copy the first item into L3, OK. Remove the first item from L3, OK. And uh, now that while loop can't run anymore because there are no items in there, so it gets to the point of returning L3, which means that merge sort from um, the seventh call, sorry, merge from the seventh call of merge sort has now finished running. So we return execution back up to merge sort, merge falls off the stack heap, and the seventh call of merge sort can now return 8 and 3, sorry, 8 and 5 as the value of L2 from the original call to merge sort. So we're now back finally to the original call to merge sort. It's got an L1 value that is here and it has an L2 value which is here and it proceeds to run and its final thing it has to do is now run merge on its L1 and L2. So onto the stack goes another instance of merge, this time called by call1 of merge sort which goes to create an empty list L3, and it goes through its little while loop. While list 1 and list 2 have items in them, yes they do, it compares the values of the first item in L1 to the first item in list 2, and is the first item in L1 smaller? Yes it is. So it goes on and appends the bigger value, which is the first item in L2 to L3. It removes the first item from L L2. It then gets to the end of its if block, goes back to the beginning of the while loop. They still have items. Both of them still have items. So it continues. And it compares the first items again. Is the first one in L1 smaller than L2? No, it's not. So it jumps to our else branch. And it appends the first item from L1 into list 3. It removes that item from uh, list 1. And it goes back to the start of our while loop. They both still have items. So again, it compares the first items in each of L1 and L2. L1's first item is a 4. L2's first item is a 5. 4 is smaller than 5, so we go on to run this, uh, this if block, and we append to L3 the, f the first item now in list 2, which is a 5. We also remove it from list 2, and we get to the end of our while loop. We go back to the start of the while loop to do the test again, and oh no, list 2 has no items. So we can't run the while loop. We jump straight down to the next uh, block of code, which is while list 1 has items in it. Yes, it does. It's still got a 4 and a 3 in it. So we append the first one of those to list 3, and we remove it from list 1. Um, and we check at the start of the while loop. Does it still have items in it? Yes, it does. It still has a 3 in it. So let's append that 3 to list 3. Let's remove that from L1. And let's try again. Ah, no, it's empty. So we proceed to the next block. L2 is empty, so we return L3 back to uh, the first call, our original call of merge sort. Whew, execution finally returns to this line in merge sort. So merge sort call one has now got a list returned to it by merge that contains eight, six, five, four, and three. And that means that this first instance of merge sort can return control back to whatever it called it. It comes off the stack heap and we are finished. We have completed our trace table. We have nothing left on the stack heap. And merge sort returns 8, 6, 5, 4, 3.
There you go. That is how you do a tracing of that particular algorithm. And if they give you that in an exam, it will be hard uh, to keep in your mind where you're up to, but you can do it. It's very procedural. you just got to keep track of where you are on the stack, keep track of which call we're in, which is why the call numbers are really, really useful. And every time you return back to a previous call, just copy down all the numbers so you've got all the right values there so that when you do your subsequent calls uh, to merge sort, you, you know exactly what to pass in as the parameters. It does really help to make a note of um, what these lists are. They are the values of list one for call two or list one for call one, list one for call seven and so on so that you can kind of remember that when you come to do your merging in those uh, calls. There's a lot to take in there. Practice makes perfect. Go draw yourself a trace table, do it yourself, practice it. If you get stuck, come back, watch the video, see where I'm up to and check your answers against this finished solution. But basically, um, yeah, you're just going to have to practice this over and over again until you get it right. Make some of your own ones up with your own lists. Don't bother with more than five items in the list or your, your, um, your trace table might get really, really long. Maybe just try it with, say, four items. Try a slightly easier one and um, just practice the technique. But that is how you trace uh, an algorithm in uh, a merge sort algorithm, sorry, using the algorithms, the pseudocode given to you by AQA. There's one final point to this question that we haven't really looked at, but we mentioned right at the start, and that is this final uh, part of the question, which says, explain why there will be three occasions when there will be four stack frames on the stack when the subroutine call merge sort, list of sort, one, five, is made. So, it's sort of hard to explain why, and actually, if you look at the mark scheme, it's not so much a question of explaining why, it's more a question, actually, of describing when. Um, and if we look at the circumstances, they are as follows. The first time we come across a situation where there are four items on our stack heap, it's when merge sort call one has called merge sort call two, and call two has called call three to run, and call three has called call four. So in that circumstance, when one calls two, which calls three, which calls four, that is four stack frames on the heap. The second time it occurs is when call one has called call two, and call three then, having finished with call four, execution returns call three, and then it calls call five again. Okay, so that's the second time that we have four items on our stack frame. And we can kind of trace it back by going, well, five goes to three, that's one, two, and then three goes, comes from two, so that's a third one on there, and two comes from one, so that's the fourth one on there. The final time it happens is not another call to merge sort, but when the third call of merge sort calls merge, because, of course, merge is a function. That, therefore, requires a stack frame. Even though it's a different function, doesn't matter, it still goes on the stack. So now we've got four items on the stack frame. We've got the first call of merge sort, the second call of merge sort, the third call of merge sort, and then we've got merge running from the third call of merge sort. Um, so there's nothing that really shows us that in the trace table. Um, instead, you just have to understand what's happening when these functions run. And when functions call functions, they place stack frames on the stack and you just need to know that and if you know that then you can follow through um, the uh, you can follow through what's happening not just in the trace table to the uh, local variables or the for each instance of the function but you can also imagine what's happening on the stack and that's why I said right at the start that it's really helpful if you can keep in mind the stack as well as the trace table while you're going through this exercise so in terms of writing our answer to this, we can say there will be four stack frames on the stack in each of the following circumstances. When merge sort call one calls call two, which calls call three, which calls call four. When merge sort call one calls call two, which calls call three, which calls call five. And when merge sort call one calls call two, which calls 
call three, which calls merge. And those are the three times, the three occasions when there's going to be four stack frames on the stack. So as I say, tricky one. It's not actually an explain question, really. It's more a describe. But this is the answer that they're looking for in the mask scheme. So maybe just be uh, a little bit aware of that. Um, and uh, just keep that in mind if you get a similar question to this in future.